<laughs> Go ahead. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite colleagues and also the first keynote speaker of COGSI 2022, Professor Yoshi Kashima. Um, in my opinion, sorry, Yoshi, I'm going to say some nice things about you right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think Yoshi's one of the preeminent people working in the social sciences today. Um, and the focus of his research, which you'll hear about, is on the dynamic processes by which culture is formed, maintained, and transformed over time. And that includes, relevantly for cognitive science, how those dynamics interact with our cognition, being shaped by it as well as shaping it. Um, his work spans a truly enormous range of topics, um, from things that we might consider pure cognitive science, like how people update beliefs or reason about stereotypes or form judgments of other people, uh, to things that are more on the meso or group level, like how polarization occurs, um, norm learning, uh, information transmission over social networks, to even stuff at what might, we might consider the macro or the cultural level, like about cooperation or emotion or characteristics of large-scale societies. Um, he also has lived experience in three different cultures himself, having grown up in Japan and lived in America and Australia. People may defer into whether Australia and America are different culturally, but I think so, right? Um, uh, when I was putting this uh, intro together, I realized if I tried to list all of Yoshi's accomplishments, we'd be here all day, uh, but I'll just basically note that um, he has, is a fellow of more societies than we have time to enumerate. He's taken on leadership roles, um, both large and small, um, sky-high citation rate, blah, blah, blah. Um, and instead of basically boring us all with that, I'll just say that as a colleague, I've learned a tremendous amount from Yoshi, not just about how to be a good scientist, uh, but also how to be a good person. So I am really pleased to give everyone here a small part of the opportunity to uh, learn from Yoshi. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Yoshi Kashima. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for that wonderful introduction. I, I was wondering who it was that he was talking about. Anyway, um, very good to be here. I'm a social psychologist by training, and this is the very first time that I ever come to cognitive science uh, a meeting at the international level. So it's really wonderful to be here, and the, um, I hope I'm not going to disappoint you too much. Anyway, the, um, the topic is the uh, psychology of cultural dynamics. And the, um, um, as everybody has been talking about, we are facing many and diverse challenges at this point in time as a humankind. And the, um, in the past, we, the humans, have adapted to these sorts of challenges by constructing and modifying human niche. And by the, what enables the niche construction is actually culture, I'd like to argue. That's the information that's socially transmittable and the uh, accumulated over time. And the cultural information enable us to create these sorts of built environments, wonderful and monuments around the world, but also more humble but important dwellings. And if you look at technologies, computers, but not only that, social institutions, values, and all the rest of it. These are all about culture. And the, um, facing many and diverse challenges at this point, the, in the past, uh, it seems like human populations have uh, modified their cultures to um, adapt to these sorts of challenges. And the, uh, one of the things that seems to enable many human populations around the world to adapt to these sorts of threatening environments was cultural tightness. And what we mean by tight culture is the kind of a, uh, it's an, a meta norm. It's a norm about norms. And the, um, it basically says you really have to follow your norms, and tightly so. And the, um, that means there's much less of an individual variability and in expressivity. But in, in, and if there's any sort of a violation of norms, there'll be a severe punishment. So everybody will be in line. Now, these sorts of tight cultures enable, though, 
human populations to come together and coordinate and cooperate amongst themselves so that they can enact collective action and manage these sorts of threats. Failing to do so, probably the populations would dissolve and disappear. And actually, this sort of tightness seems to count even nowadays. There's a relationship between the uh, cultural tightness and the, um, uh, the ability to cope with COVID. So uh, countries like Ghana, uh, Sri Lanka, and Vietnam, which tend to be pretty tight, um, they managed to keep their COVID cases fairly low at the beginning. Um, but the uh, more looser cultures like Israel, Argentina, Colombia, and so on, they tended not to. So even nowadays, this sort of cultural tightness seems to count at the macro level. Now, these sorts of challenges have, haven't escaped the academic world. And these are some of my uh, intellectual heroes, the uh, Kavali Sforza, Mark Feldman, and the, um, many others. These are anthropologists and biologists who responded to the thoughts of how do we manage these sorts of challenges and came up with the answer, which is, I would say, cultural evolution. So they've been really thinking hard about how cultures might evolve. And that's pretty much the kind of thing I've been interested in. But let me just uh, make one small comment about the terminology. I avoid the term evolution just because that tends to have a very unfortunate connotation. At least in the um, intellectual history, the social evolution had the very bad name. And the, in ordinary parlance, the evolve often means better and advanced. And people are willing to say some peoples are in some way better evolved than others. In order to avoid these sorts of possible confusions, I avoid the term evolution. And let me haste to add that the, uh, these guys that I mentioned um, are not a uh, social evolutionist at all. They are Darwinian evolutionists. And they have no trace whatsoever of these sorts of uh, potential confusion whatsoever. But still, I worry, as a social psychologist, if I have to talk with the general public, how would they interpret my term of cultural evolution? Anyway, um, these sorts of cultural evolution, cultural dynamics at the macro level, have been carrying us all the way through the uh, geo, uh, geological epoch called the Holocene. More than about uh, 10,000 years ago, that the uh, humans emerged out of Africa and spread around the world. The, uh, we have been enjoying this incredible, a uh, nice weather that's called Holocene Optimum, as you probably, many of you know. And the, um, throughout this period, the, um, um, we have managed to spread the world and the, uh, change the face of the earth quite a bit. And the, um, uh, more recently, however, the human activities has increased so much, so much, that the, um, um, it began to influence the ecosystem of the planet you know, itself. So whatever it is that you're looking at, um, the statistics here, um, over there, the, the top left-hand corner, you have carbon dioxide. And over there, methane, ocean acidification, any of these are fairly um, blunt statistics which indicate how much of an impact humans might have had on the face of the planet. As you can see, everything is upwards, right, towards the um, more recent times. And especially after 1950, after the World War II, the humans have expanded enormously. And in that period, our population and GDP, you name it, any indicator of human activity has skyrocketed. That caused, of course, as you know, many of these repercussions on the planet Earth. One of the things that um, really changed the uh, um, human population distribution around the world is urbanization. As you can see, the, most of the time, we humans have been living in a rural area, right? And the urban population has been really, really minuscule. But around the uh, 
19th century, or perhaps even the 18th century, when the Industrial Revolution started taking place, people began to move into the city. And more recently, after 1950, the um, urbanization has shot up. And the, uh, just very recently, a few years ago, the estimation is that uh, more humans are living in the urban area than in the rural area. So the majority of us are living in the cocoon of the urban environment, the cities, away from the rest of nature. And the, uh, this kind of a, uh, ecological uh, and social ecological uh, circumstances had the, um, um, an interesting uh, implications and impact on culture. This is a wonderful study of the um, Oxford Eng English Dictionary entries of a, uh, words that are related, or quotes and so on, that are related to trees and plants. What you can see is that the 1825 is peak. That's about the time of the origin of the species has appeared, a few years before that. And it plummets. In other words, the cultural entry into the, um, uh, the cultural information entry to OED has the, um, um, plummeted over that period of time, closer to the 20th century. And we also have a more recent um, statistic about it, looking at the um, English language narratives and stories, the fictions. Uh, again, the references to nature have decreased, especially since 1950. So these sorts of uh, um, macro-level cultural differences uh, have occurred over time. The changes have occurred. And of course, the, um, one of the correlates of that is the climate change. You've seen these sorts of graphs, I'm pretty sure, many times. OK. So we are facing these sorts of challenges. How do we deal with that? And in fact, how can we actually understand these sorts of challenges? And how do cultures change over time in these sorts of ways? And um, it's really the question about the micro-macro relationships, right? Any human sciences worth the salt would have faced this question. Linguistics, of course, language and speech, sociology, anthropology, and of course, any other sorts of social sciences. And I'm pretty sure cognitive science has too, if you're interested in, say, for instance, language. So how do we understand the micro-macro dynamics? That, I think, is really the key question that I would like to be thinking about. And um, my approach has been to insert in the middle the meso level, which is social network level, or if you like, um, a formalized ways of representing social interaction patterns, and how that might influence the uh, micro to macro and macro to micro uh, dynamics. And that's been the focus of my research over the past hmm, probably about 20 years. So social networks like that. And I tend to think of that as the potentials for social interaction and also cultural transmission. And the uh, people linked by social network ties tend uh, more likely to be interacting with each other and transmitting cultural information. Now, speaking about cultural transmission, though, the, um, Michael Tomasello has uh, distinguished three, at least three different uh, uh, types of cultural transmission. And the, um, um, much of the cultural evolutionary research has been focusing on the first two, imitative learning and instructed learning how children pick up the cultural information and how cultural information is instructed to the children by adults. And of course, if you're interested in how the cultural information gets transmitted across generations, that should be where you should be looking at, right? But um, if you're interested in thinking about how cultures might change and the, in real time, and how these cultural processes might be, in fact, for collective action. And then I would argue that that's something we should be looking at very closely. And in order to do that, actually social network analysis and that sort of perspective, relational perspective, tends to be very helpful. 
And uh, as many people have said, we'd like to say that the, uh, there is a constant uh, internalization and externalization of cultural information as we interact with each other. And the, um, uh, this constant process is actually what makes up the micro-level cultural dynamics. The really interesting question is how would they influence the macro level via MESA? Okay, well, first, um, I'd like to talk about the macro to micro relationship. And the, um, as a key concept, I'd like to use the concept of norms, social norms. Um, as I said, I'm a social psychologist, right? And the uh, sociologists um, uh, all, all talk about norms all the time as well. And the, um, it, in order to think about the, uh, how norms may influence our behavior in a kind of much more uh, contextualized and situated ways, um, I thought, well, actually, we really need to know first how we learn social norms. I mean, social norms is some sort of a, a macro level property of a population of people, a bunch of people. How can we actually learn it? And the, how do we conceptualize it? And how are those sorts of learned representations about society influence your behavior? And that is the kind of question I began to ask. And the, um, um, good. A, let's say here's one person, ego, in that social network structure. And what we'd like to be doing is to think about how that person would learn the social norm of within that uh, social network structure. Um, in my view, there are at least two different ways in which we can learn social norm. One is the conceptual route. That is to say, somebody tells you and say, well, this is what the norm is in this community. So learn it. Right? The other one is a much more experiential route. That is to say, you look at what other people do and learn what the majority of the people or most of the people do. And that's the, yeah, those two are very different um, uh, approaches, right, to learning a norm. One is both could happen. Is there any evidence that uh, one is more important than the other? And that was the kind of question I was wondering about. So to examine that, um, we went to a rural city in the outback, or close to the outback of Australia. Um, Sydney and Melbourne is many, many kilometers away. And the, um, um, the city itself is about 10,000. So it's not the small city, but the, it's very far away from other population centers. And the, um, of course, if you are interested in finding out how engaged these people are in their community, in other words, the norm of a, um, community engagement, there's no research about that. Right? The only way you can find out is either you ask people or you observe others. And uh, because um, all these sorts of observations and data are embedded in social networks, and has a lot of interdependencies in it, you really need to use a, st a special kind of statistic uh, approach to uh, analyze the data. And we did that. And basically, we found that the, there's no evidence of conceptual root to norm learning. So basically, people look at other people and what they do to learn their norms. Now, um, how can we actually acquire a, some sort of a um, overall representation of this community? I mean, you might be looking at just one, one person, but not that, right? You must have been looking at many other people's behaviors as well. And how do we actually acquire them and aggregate them and to form some sort of ideas about the overall um, distribution of behaviors within the community? Well, the um, one way to think about it is to uh, conceptualize it as an exemplar-based category learning. Your community is basically a category, right? And the uh, people and people's behaviors, they are exemplars. You, you process those sorts of information, accumulate them in your memory, and somehow the, uh, you have some ideas about what the norm 
within the community might be based on the local information that you receive in your social network. Um, and it turns out that the, um, um, there have been very well established experimental paradigms in cognitive psychology as well as in social psychology. And they, um, um, they developed the very different sorts of uh, uh, computation models to capture these sorts of data. And probably many of you are much more familiar with that uh, than I am. But uh, one of the things we did was to postulate this distributed memory model that would enable us to say, right, depending on how people access information, actually the um, categorization type of model might fall out. And depending on another different um, uh, access, you get the impression formation type of approach. So um, in a way, the, um, they were integrated into a more algorithmic model of the uh, cognition in this approach. And the, um, um, the data seemed to be pretty, pretty good. So, and they, uh, it was published more than 20 years ago, but as far as I know, nobody has told me that it's been completely discredited. So I'm sort of still talking about it. And so that's the kind of a, um, the exemplar-based category learning that might be happening in order to learn your social norm. If there's any truth to this kind of theorizing, well, what it means is that human memory system is set up to learn norms. We are norm-learning creatures. Um, the next question is how can those sorts of norms be reminded of and would they somehow influence human behaviors? Um, to cut the long story short, we did the, uh, another set of experiments, and the, um, um, uh, this one was a, a basically public goods game, um, repeated over time, uh, 31 rounds in all, and the, um, there are four people playing the game. Um, but the, um, one, that is one aspect of it, which is a little different to usual, is that the, um, they are given a chance to engage in what we call a norm talk. And that is to say, the, uh, be able to send a message to somebody else about somebody else with regard to the extent to which they are following the norm. So in the context of public goods game, the, uh, it's really the norm of cooperation. Are these people following the norm of cooperation? Are they doing the right thing or not? And the, uh, there are two different ways, at least, that, that can happen. One is the injunction, just purely and simply say, you should do this, and people should do this or shouldn't do that. And the, um, but the other one is gossip, right? So by gossiping that so-and-so has done this, and that's really bad, you shouldn't do it, right? Um, you're talking about somebody else um, behind their back, and perhaps it's not really a kind of nice thing to do, perhaps, but it does have the implication of clear, clarifying what the speaker think is the right thing to do. Right? So it is another way of conveying and communicating the norm. And would that influence people's behavior? Turned out it does. Um, let me just uh, point out one line. Um, on the x-axis, we have time, so different rounds, 31 of them. On the y-axis, we have the level of cooperation. And the, um, um, the, if there's no norm talk, people are just playing the game throughout. It starts off fairly high, but eventually it declines. But the, um, when people engage in a norm talk, which happened after every five rounds, it actually increases the cooperation level momentarily. It, the cooperation level spikes, but then it begins to decline. And then after five rounds, it spikes and declines and so on. This sort of zigzagging the uh, pattern uh, occurs in every other condition in which norm talk was permitted. So it seems like norm talk is enough to remind people of the norm and that can actually influence behavior. But that is not enough, actually. It has to happen repeatedly and in some way probably ritualized. 
in order for it to work. Okay, so so far it's all about the how macro level norms would influence the micro level behaviors. And then the, um, the next step is really to begin to think about how micro level things would influence the macro level. And uh, in order to do it, we began to think about how cultural information might spread within social network and what might be the implication of that for social structure. So coming back to the same sort of social network structure and there are two people and if they're talking to each other, of course, the information will be exchanged and from there through social networks, the um, information might spread. Do you think the same information is going to be repeated um, and uh, you very much accurately transmitted from one person to another. If you know, the, if you ever played a child's game, the broken telephone or Chinese whispers, you know exactly what happens, right? It goes to shit. <laughs> and there's a good way of exa examining these sorts of uh, a transformation of information. And it's called the method of theory of reproduction. So you create the stimulus and you ask a first person to um, process it and reproduce it from memory. And then it passes on to the second person and the second person does the same thing and the third and so on. It's basically a communication chain, the Chinese whispers. And the, um, um, it was originally, as you probably know, the first um, user in psychology was Frederick Bartlett. In 32, his classic volume, um, the, um, this method was uh, used extensively Actually, as far as I know, he published a paper about it in 1923. That was the first appearance. But after that, it's been used in, in several different ways, and most recently in the uh, psycholinguistic research um, by Simon Kirby and the, uh, his uh, colleagues in iterated learning. Um, quite independently from that, though, actually, I didn't know about the uh, uh, Simon's work when I began to work on it. Um, in 2000, we began to work on this sort of a method. And in this case, we wanted to look at the cultural stereotypes. How the story that might embed cultural stereotypes might uh, be transmitted in this sort of serial reproduction and how the content might change. And so the example of it is uh, Gary the footballer. By the way, the football ball here is the Australian rules football. It's a fast and furious game that you don't see anywhere else in the world, right? It's a kind of weird game, but anyway, that's, some of us love it. And the, um, um, it's a really macho game, right? And the, uh, you can see that the, some of the stereotypes to go with it is beer loving, beer drinking, and uh, drink driving, and police abusing kind of uh, players, right? And uh, you just don't see those sorts of players buying flowers for themselves or perhaps listening to Mozart in a car. And the, uh, but we created a story that embeds all these different sorts of stories, um, episodes in the, in the story. And the, uh, we put it through the serial production chains and to cut the long story short, basically the inconsistent information that are to uh, inconsistent to stereotypes, shared stereotypes, tend to drop out. You would expect that, right? If you know anything about the conventionalization that uh, Bartlett talked about, this should happen. And indeed, it did happen. And the, um, um, what's interesting is why? Why would this happen? And the uh, one thing that the, um, uh, we hit upon is the functions of different types of information. So stereotype consistent information and inconsistent information probably have different kinds of functions. And our analysis was that stereotype consistent information tends to be um, uninformative. It basically covers the same ground. You already know what the stereotypes are and um, this information is telling you exactly the same thing. It's not informative, but it is very socially connective in that um, it basically conveys this sort of a sense. You and I share the same ideas about the world. We know what the, uh, you know, these sorts of footballers are like and wink, wink, 
we are talking about the same thing, we know, right? But the um, stereotype inconsistent information, on the other hand, tends to be a lot more informative, but not really necessarily socially connective. Somebody might not be able to understand or think that oh, that can't be true. They might challenge you. There's a lot of a, a transaction cost. Well, then the, uh, there's a, a kind of dilemma. Are you going to be informative or are you going to be socially connective? Which way do you go? In a small chat, and if you want to tell a good yarn, well, you are going to be after social connectivity. You want to connect to other people. So which would you emphasize? Stereotype consistent information. That should be what it is, and that's the analysis for us. And the, um, um, if you look at the uh, correlation patterns, um, this is basically what happens. Stereotype consistency, uh, stereotypicality tends to predict the uh, social connectivity, perceived social connectivity of the information, tends to increase communicability, and then actually that predicts the real diffusion of information in social networks. But um, if you think about why that uh, stereotypicality connectivity connection is there, actually what's moderating it is the uh, stereotype endorsement, or what you think the community endorses. So if this is right, well then by manipulating your perception of the uh, community endorsement, you should be able to change the pattern of communication, right? And that's indeed what happened. So in one condition, we told people that, yeah, uh, as you might have guessed, most of the people that you're going to be talking to or writing to um, have, share the same sort of stereotypes about footballers. That was a high endorsement condition. In the other condition, we told them, well, actually, we studied that, and it turned out that was not true. Most of the people questioned that. And then you basically retain the stereotype consistency bias when the endorsement is seen to be there, when it's seen to be absent, it disappears. So um, it seems like the community engagement and community endorsement, that is what's driving these sorts of stereotype consistency bias. And indeed, you find the clearest uh, stereotype consistency bias when you are talking to your in-group mates about an out-group. So it really is um, having a function of clearly differentiating between your in-group and the out-group and creating that shared culture within the in-group. And another interesting um, uh, finding, set of findings about these sorts of cultural transmission is that first of all, emotive information tends to be transmitted at micro and macro levels a lot better. Emotiveness is a key to the cultural information transmission. And another thing that's interesting that recently discovered by Breithaupt and his colleagues is that the um, um, serial reproduction narratives tends to a, uh, uh, preserve the emotion that's felt from the story, and especially happiness and sadness. And the, um, so all these seem to suggest that the emotiveness and what sort of emotion is embedded in a story is really an important part of it. And it seems to me to make very good sense because in my mind, emotion is the uh, a kind of, um, it's really about the um, adaptive significance of the information that you're processing, in my theory anyway. So emotive information means it's adaptively important. Look at it is basically what emotion tells you, and people do. Right, so far we've been just looking at the um, um, information flow when there's no impediment, no conflict. What happens if there is a conflict between those two, the same two people? And of course, the information about the you know, conflict might spread. But do you think the exact same information is going to spread in both, sun, both camps? You know, it's not going to happen, right? And basically, um, as the uh, originally, initially neutral uh, conflict story um, it spreads into these sorts of a, uh, a separate communities, the, um, the in-group 
begins to be portrayed as good guys. And so in-group favoring narrative tends to stay. And the um, out-group degrading narrative tends to stay as well. So it really sort of a clearly differentiates the two groups. We are good guys, they're bad guys. And that can create a culture of conflict without really experiencing the conflict itself. Being a partisan in these sorts of situations can actually fuel the conflict. Right. So in these sorts of challenging situations that we have been talking about, the, um, um, we are the constructing a, a human niche by making use of cultural information and they, uh, um, uh, try to do something about it. We try to get together and collectively manage these sorts of challenges. And um, um, at this point in time, as we face many and diverse challenges as humankind, we engage in a massive conversation about the collective futures. And you know, technology has given us a, a great platform to do it, right? <laughs> Things like Twitter and other forms of social networking sites. And social me media seems to be playing a very important role. And um, as you probably know, that has become a very major research topic in many of the uh, social science disciplines. And I think cognitive science as well. Anyway, as you know, the, um, there has been an increasing polarization, especially in the United States, 1994. There was a fair bit of overlap, but 20 years later, there's a much of a, a separation between Republicans and the uh, Democrats. And I tend to think of this as a kind of like a forager's dilemma. That is to say, a forager is facing the dilemma between exploitation or exploration, right? Should we stay or should we go? Should we stay, stick to the status quo or should we change? It's the same sort of a story. And the, um, in these sorts of uh, challenging situations, I would argue that the, everybody's interested in finding out how we should be behaving. And not only that, everybody wants to have a say in it. And the, um, the fundamental um, a dilemma here is are we going to stick to the age-old conservative ways of doing it, or are we going to change over? This conservatism versus change-oriented, that is going to be a fairly universal tendency, I would argue, everywhere in the world. It has to happen. And the, um, there's another sort of set of evidence to suggest that the perceived and actual uh, political polarization has increased over time in the US. And oftentimes, social media communication has been implicated at the, um, as a potential um, a reason for it. And the, so the argument has this kind of structure, right? At the macro level, we have political polarization happening. At the meso level, we have this kind of a separation of the uh, two um, warring, so to speak, um, communities of a, uh, uh, a tweets. And the, um, um, perhaps it's this a, a communication structure, echo chambers, might be giving rise to that uh, polarization. Is that the case? And that sort of raises a very interesting set of questions for psychologists like ourselves, myself, and many of you, I think. Anyway, the cognitive scientists, I would say, would probably be very interested in it. That is, what's the role of cognition? What's the role of the individual level? Are they going to play some sort of role? Or is the uh, social media pa the, uh, environment so powerful that it's going to trump everything? Well, I would like to argue that actually the cognition matters. And in fact, the cognitive styles in interaction with the uh, meso-level network dynamics can actually produce a very complex and different types of macro level processes that can give rise to a rather difficult to manage situations. Um, in order to investigate that, 
Um, I dredged out that uh, a 20-year-old uh, uh, memory model that I was dealing with, and the uh, um, constructed uh, a model that can embed two different kinds of ideological biases. One is the uh, interpretation bias, and that is the inputs com coming into the cognitive system is filtered through ideological lens, no matter what, or not. So that's presence or absence of interpretive filter at the interpretation level. The other one is about the uh, updating of memory and the changing of opinions. And one um, type of bias is that you stick to your ideology no matter what, and they uh, weigh it much more strongly than new information that might contradict it. And so those two different kinds of biases could be independent of each other, and in combination, it can produce four different uh, uh, cognitive styles, right? And of course, they are kind of a more continuous, and the, uh, this is a simplification, but uh, it sort of gives you an idea of what sort of cognitive dynamics might ensue. So to examine that, the, uh, we put through 50 random inputs, and this is what happens. Um, here on the y-axis, we have the extent to which the outputs that cognitive system puts out is aligned with ideology or not, or the, aligned with the opposite of the ideology. Right? And the first kind of completely ideologically a, a, a driven a, a agents wouldn't change um, one iota. No matter what comes in, you know, they stick to that uh, ideology. And the uh, second one is the ideological filter, but the, uh, there's no uh, ego involvement in the ideology itself. And what's interesting here is that the, uh, these cognitive agents can produce the exact opposite of an ideology. If there is an ideologist, then there's going to be a, a nemesis, if you like. And the third type that has the um, um, no bias in interpretation of incoming information, but the, uh, there is a kind of a, like a drag of the ideology in updating your beliefs, well, then they, uh, eventually these guys can change their opinions, although it does take, take a while. And the last guys who have no biases whatsoever, they will go all, all over the place, depending on what sort of information you get. So depending on the type of uh, the uh, cognitive system it is that's processing ideology-laden information, the uh, cognitive level of performance is going to be quite different. Now, on top of it, we included network social influence and also partner selection process within social networks. So in other words, the, um, we put these cognitive agents together in social networks and allow them to influence each other. So that was the network influence bit. And then the last one is the uh, partner selection. It allowed cognitive agents to sever ties if they find somebody who is disagreeable. And the first two kinds that I talked about, it's fairly obvious, nothing had changes. You either have the ideology or you have an ideology and its nemesis. But the third and fourth kind that would eventually change, if depending on the inputs, have rather interesting um, consequences. Um, if those cognitive agents are embedded in the um, um, social networks of like-minded others, well then, they become ideologists. They will not change their um, beliefs and change their opinions. And adding on top of it, the partner selection process wouldn't change even it. The, it it'll probably strengthen it, if anything. What about the fourth type, who are not biased at all? These are perhaps rational people. When they are put into the uh, social networks and begin to inf influence each other, actually under most circumstances, they consensualize. They come to the middle ground. And uh, Abelson, who tried to produce bimodal distribution of uh, public opinion um, in the 60s, said, how can I ever produce a bimodal distribution of public opinion? I can't do it. At that time, there wasn't a good theory of social influence that would enable him to model this sort of bipolarization. 
And the, that's exactly what happens with this sort of a, um, uh, mechanisms. But if you add partner selection mechanisms on top of it, sometimes it can produce clustering of opinions. They basically form echo chambers and the, uh, they will consensualize within an echo chamber, but between echo chambers, there will be a diversity of opinions. And the, um, um, what you can see is that depending on the kind of cognitive mechanisms that are involved, and perhaps the distribution of these sorts of different cognitive styles in the population, the different types of the um, uh, public opinion dynamics could ensue. And that is also dependent on how people are going to choose their interaction partners. Do they disengage anybody who tend to disagree with you? Or are they willing to talk and engage with those opposing opinions? And depending on which way we go, things could be quite different. Anyway, let me just uh, wind up. Um, when a population is under large-scale societal threats like climate change and the microbial pandemic, the collective information processes go in overdrive. And the um, resultant cultural dynamics shape long-term macro-level cultural transformation and, dare I say, cultural evolution as well. And I'd like to argue and underline that understanding and integrating the knowledge about the micro and meso-level dynamics would be really critical in order for us to be able to cultivate and perhaps craft the culture that is most suitable for a desirable collective futures. And let me just uh, leave this very tentative list of the, uh, what I might call design principles for cultural change with you. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Yoshi. Um, the way we're going to do questions is we're going to alternate in-person, online, in-person, online. So if you have a question, um, uh, then go stand at the microphone like uh, Roger is uh, modeling for us. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll just flip back and forth. So go ahead and start with Roger, and then I'll read one from online. Thank you okay. so much. That was an extremely engaging, interesting, and thought-provoking talk. I really, really appreciated it. I have a very general question about um, the nature of serial reproduction effects and uh, the sort of convergence to stereotypes and the interactions that you then continued to talk about. So um, if you go back as far as Bartlett and, and, um, and in the suing work, a lot of the work that you cited, um, there's a very uh, one strong idea um, about the, where you get these, uh, the, the source of these changes of the actual input at each generation of transmission is very different from what you talked about. It's basically, we can think of it as a memory constraint. We can't perfectly, we just, even if we wanted to, we couldn't perfectly reproduce what we got. And so there's an influence of, um, of the, uh, the dynamics of memory and the constraints of memory and so, for example, um, uh, there are various ways of deriving a pattern where the, fa the features of the input that are more expected are going to be more likely to be transmitted faithfully, and the features that are less expected are going to be more likely to be transmitted as if they were something that were expected. So you get morphing, and that would, that would explain the very b most basic pattern, of course, that you got, not necessarily the later patterns that you described about the Gary the footballer stories. It would just be, it might be hard to remember um, all the features that are not characteristic of the footballer. But you presented a very different kind of story or a very different kind of emphasis, which was, I, I, I took it as a much more discretionary view of information <laughs> transition, that yep. transmission. That is that, that the information transmitter is choosing which information to reproduce faithfully and which information to not produce faithfully on the basis of the expected effects on the interaction that they're having in the process of the transmission. And I'd like to ask you, how do you see the relationship between these two views of how information changes as it's transmitted? 
is the memory based one basically not just it's it's too small to really be relevant and the dynamics that you're talking about are really what we should be focusing on or is there some other kind of interplay between the two thank you very much for the very very important question and uh, yeah, I, I, I've struggled that uh, with that sort of question and uh, yeah, in the end um, my uh, tentative answer is there are at least two different forces operating. One is definitely memory, and the, um, to the extent that the, um, many of the people who are involved in a serial reproduction experiment have a similar sort of a knowledge base and, and so on, and that's how we choose those participants, in fact. And then the, uh, the memory effect is going to be constant. And the, uh, what is potentially interesting is uh, what might be the communi communication uh, process that might be playing into that, playing on top of the memory process. And the um, um, one thing that a, sometimes happens in serial reproduction is that the, um, uh, depending on the uh, type of information that's embedded in the story, the, um, we kind of created the uh, causal chain within the story. And the also, um, the background information that doesn't have any causal structure in it. And the, um, sometimes this a causal, causally structured chain of events um, tend to produce the reverse effect. And the, um, um, a, in, in the very first experiment, I found that actually. So the, uh, my thinking is that the, when people are trying to sort out how this thing caused another thing and so on, and try to tell a coherent story, the, um, that could actually increase the tendency for you to tell that um, unexpected information to another person. Look, here's something interesting happening. But um, another thing that happens as the serial uh, reproduction happens the occurs is that the progresses is that um, the details begin to be lost. And the, uh, initially, you have plenty of um, uh, details to work with in order to make sense of these sorts of unexpected um, patterns of behaviors. But eventually, you just can't do that. And perhaps say, uh, you might end up saying, I have no idea why they say this. And uh, you know, I I'm not going to say this to this. Anybody else, I have no idea. Maybe just a mistake. And so it could actually um, lose this kind of a communication aspect, and the, uh, that might um, retain the memory-based effect a lot more strongly. Anyway, it's a long story, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, um, I think that's a very important question. And how that communicative aspect and the memory aspect um, interplay is a very interesting uh, question, I would say. Thank you for the question. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, turn to an online question. Um, uh, basically, this is going back to the, uh, the parts about cultural tightness and looseness. And the question is, um, do tighter norms always lead to successful cooperation, collaboration, and what are the trade-offs? For instance, um, there might be, you, you can think of examples where tighter norms might be destructive or suffocating or harmful, especially to certain components of the population, and that might also then hinder healthy cooperation on the population level. So how do those things trade off? I think that's a very important question, and the, uh, um, uh, there's a fair bit uh, to be looked at. Um, one thing that uh, Michelle Gelfand, who's been uh, looking at these sorts of effects uh, mostly, is uh, it has shown that and argued that the, um, a, a tightness might help you cooperate, but might um, stifle creativity. So because it doesn't um, um, allow a lot of individual expressivity and individual variations, it tends to the um, reduce the uh, creative off the wall sort of ideas. And in fact, when we have to deal with these sorts of multifaceted challenges that we are facing now, um, might require a lot of creativity rather than just going back to the old ways. And perhaps in that case, it could be a potentially very dangerous thing. Does that sort of answer your question? Depressingly, but yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
Do we have uh, another in person? Yeah. Yeah, hi, that, so that was a really cool talk and um, welcome to CogSci, I hope you come again. It, feel, it felt very like core CogSci research. Um, but I had a question about, uh, actually following on the last one about um, sort of the costs uh, and benefits of, um, of individual norms because it felt like a lot of the work that you were talking about were talking about the, with the caveat about maybe the, the like friendship circle ones, a lot about like do we crack an egg from the narrow end or the wide end, nothing really like rode on, on the outcome. Um, and of course with a lot of the examples that you gave at the beginning, that is, um, that was not the case, right? And to like maybe pick like something that I was thinking about, I guess probably because Roger was just here, um, is uh, just like norm changes in our own community, right? So in 2008, there were a pair of papers that came out suggesting everybody should use mixed effects models. Mm -hmm. Now that, within a year, you couldn't publish in, uh, certainly in psycholinguistics and a lot of cognitive psychology without using mixed effects models. Right. And in developmental psychology and social psychology, the uptake is still you know, not quite there. Now, it could just be that, you know, folks like Roger are superior human beings, and of course, psycholinguists, you know, adopted an obviously superior method. It is also the case that psycholinguists, especially for a long time, had already been doing F1 and F2 tests, and generally had, which are just like a somewhat inferior version of the same analysis, mm. had the technical skills to do their analyses in R, um, and had uh, experiments that generally allow for mixed effects models. Whereas in developmental psychology and a lot of social psychology, you would both have to change the kinds of experiments that you're running. Uh, for a lot of people, especially back in 2008, adopt new technical techniques that you didn't previously have and accept that probably a lot of the already published work is spurious. So there is like personal reputational costs as well involved in changing this norm. And not surprisingly, the norm was just easier to change in some communities than others. And I was curious um, what you or others have been thinking about in terms of the that sort of like the content of the norms and their relationships to uh, the individuals who are deciding whether or not to adopt and promulgate them. Thank you very much for the very important question. And of course, the content matters. And so we can't really talk uh, generally about any sort of norm. Um, although there may be some sort of similar processes that are happening, but uh, yeah, depending on the, the exact content, its cost, its reward, all these sorts of a, uh, surrounding uh, parameters are going to be quite different. So I would imagine the uptake and also maintenance are going to be fairly different. And the, uh, especially about the cost of it in your example, I think is a very important one. And the, uh, um, a, a kind of a, hacking back to one of the experiments I talked about, but by telling people this is important, this is a, a new norm and we should be doing it, People might be willing to change over once, but actually if the cost is very high, the maintaining it is going to be even more difficult, I think. People would go back to the old ways and say, eh, can't be bothered. And so um, the, there has to be some kind of a collective effort to go, oof, let's do it. But then again, there has to be some kind of collective effort to help people maintain these sorts of things and coming up with the exemplars of using better ways of testing the theories and so on. And I, as you said, social psychologists are one of the worst offenders of these sorts of things because they are, uh, stimuli tend to be very expensive to produce that they, uh, we can't oftentimes say uh, and do multiple uh, replications of very different contents. So, but uh, I think it is possible. Um, with the uh, better training and so on. But the uh, cost reduction, I think, is going to be a really a key, I would argue. Would that answer your question? Great. Thank you. So I think we have, I'm ambitious, time for one more question. There's a lot more than one question on the Q&A, so um, I've copied them all, and we'll see if there's a way to get them answered later. Um, but uh, I'm going to go, and same if you have uh, questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A, and I'll see if I can get them to Yoshi. Um, this last question, though, is basically, I think, building off some of these other ones um, and says, uh, thank you, I'm bouncing off from what you talk about, and the question is, how might we represent power and power differentials in these models, whether meso or micro level? So things like, you know, professors having more power, institutions having more power, um, and, or, or even, you know, power in systems, like systems of oppression. Ha, 
<laughs> That's a hard question and a million dollar question, minute. I would say. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to even try to answer that question, but yes, that's absolutely a very significant question. And uh, yeah, one thing I would say, though, is that power comes in um, the, at, at two different levels. One is in modifying people's overt behavior, and the other level is modifying people's covert behaviors or beliefs and thoughts. And uh, yeah, depending on which way you want to go, the, your power may have very different sort of implications. And the, um, um, I don't think we have uh, those sorts of uh, uh, models that enable us to tease apart those different uh, sorts of uh, uh, mechanisms of power um, within social networks, as far as I know. But that's a great theoretical and uh, probably modeling challenge, I'd say. Awesome. Thank you, thank you everyone, and thank you, Yoshi. Uh, we now have a 20-minute break, but first let's thank uh, applause.